meta populations. What happens when you get multiple populations of an organism that can interact and intermingle with one another? Define meta population. I just kind of did. Define genetic drift. This should be something you could look back to your Hardy Weinberg for. And define urban biogeography. Explain how immigration and emigration play roles among parts of a meta population. Define urban biogeography. I've never seen that above. Explain how it's studied. And determine what factors influence movement through an urban ecosystem. So meta populations. It's a long word. So it is important to remember that within an organism's distribution, they're not always contiguous. So it's not like the entirety, entire distribution of American beavers is just one, um, one beaver every, I don't know, within eye shot of one another. So a beaver sees another beaver sees another. That's not how the beaver population works. There are beaver patches. There are certain places where beavers live and certain places where they do not live. They may or may not have overlapping ranges. They may or may not be visiting one another. And populations are really not spatially contiguous. Rather, it's made up of many subpopulations. So take, for example, these uh, butterflies right here. You have each yellow dot is an individual butterfly. You see there are some habitat patches with butterflies and some habitat patches without butterflies. This is probable because in sometimes you can get little, little <clears throat> local extinctions. Perhaps a particularly voracious bird came in and ate some of them. Perhaps a <clears throat> um, spider outbreak occurred in some of these places. Perhaps the patch just isn't big enough to sustain a population for more than a few generations. Consider where, what would impact where a meta butterfly would live. I mentioned predation, but perhaps you can think of other things. What, are, what is between those patches? So as I said, those were an alpine group, perhaps it's mountain, mountains. Um, I, that's, that's just what you see above a certain elevation. Um, perhaps there are patches of, for, of meadow within a forest, or perhaps they actually are islands. And within these, this meta population, there is immigration and emigration between these, which leads to this kind of cyclical <clears throat> expansion, extinction kind of thing. So what we have here is a bunch of uh, oranges. There's a fun experiment done. It, um, there was an, a little mite that lives on oranges. It's prey mite. It eats the orange tissue. And they actually covered all but a little bit of the orange with Vaseline because Vaseline is not something the mite can live on. So now in all these oranges covered mostly with Vaseline, <clears throat> there are limited patches for this little orange eating mite. And what it will do is it'll move between these oranges. So sometimes it'll be present, sometimes it'll be absent, and it should be able to expand over the entirety of its range. They also introduced uh, these predatory mites. And the predatory mites will eat the prey mites. Now, eventually, it's possible that the population may go extinct. So if the prey gets to a critical level <clears throat> on one orange, it could go extinct. And then the predators, well, they have nothing to eat, so they go extinct. But then that orange can later be recolonized. So this kind of phase, this cycle of colonization, followed by predator colonization, followed by local extinctions, followed by recolonization, is actually true for most predator-prey relationships within meta populations. And we'll discuss uh, Laca Volterra at a different lecture. So the idea is, though, with Laca Volterra in these predator-prey cycles, eventually one of them will go extinct. They're oscillating and oscillating, and at some point, one of them is going to oscillate out. Oops. And when that happens, there needs to be an ability to recolonize from somewhere else. And that's where metapopulations can actually increase the stability of an organism overall. If it was just one orange, you know eventually both would go extinct. But if it's many oranges, sometimes they can go extinct in one spot and still survive from another. So genetic drift is part of this as well. If you will remember back to your days of, of uh, Hardy Weinberg, uh, 
you remember that in small populations, there is genetic drift eventually going to the fixation or extinction of an allele. In larger populations, there is genetic drift eventually going towards the fixation or the extinction of an allele. In an incredibly large population, it's just a very slow genetic drift towards the fixation or extinction of an allele, but it is an inevitable drift. One thing that keeps this drift from uh, becoming universal is if there are metapopulations, in one spot, the allele goes to extinction, in another, the allele goes to fixation, and if there's gene flow between those populations, then it introduces, it reintroduces the allele to the population that has had the extinction from the population that has had the fixation. So it can actually increase the genetic diversity because these individual populations are each an experiment in genetic drift. But altogether, they are basically at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. <clears throat> and the assumption it would be of Hardy-Weinberg is large population. Well, if you have a small population, that's a violation. But if you have a hundred small populations, it might not be as much of a violation. So genetic drift through metapopulations, genetic flow through, ge through metapopulations can maintain a heterozygosity of the species overall. For an example of a metapopulation, we can go to an urban area or to mountains. Let's look at urban first. Montaigne just means of mountains. I'm not misspelling mountains. I, I know what I'm doing. Anyway, um, this urban areas, uh, these can be small populations in each one of the parks, such as in Cincinnati by Faith in, look at by Faith and Kane in 1978. Each one of these parks is going to be one spot where they can find flies, diptera, and beetles, coleoptera. So the question then runs, how is this population actually uh, founded? Well, what could be true is that this could be a population that is a remnant or relic of the area before settlement of man. So it could be that this um, park is a, relic, is a remnant of a pre-existing forest. It can also be that the this was a plowed area, plowed over, farmed over, paved over, jackhammered up, and turned into a park, in which case the population would be founded by the colonization of different organisms to this, in much the same way as organisms would colonize an island. So what Faith and Cain did is they sampled all the parks to see if the number of species they found at a park would be um, correlating with the park area. And they found, unsurprisingly, more space, more bugs. When you see how the number of samples here, <clears throat> the first sample collected uh, 30 different organisms at French Park. And then the second sample, you got up to 47. The third sample, you got up to 58. Fifth sample got to, or fourth sample got to 60. And fifth sample got 61, how it just kind of has this linear function. What's happening there is that's the species area curve. The more you sample, the closer you're gonna to get to flattening out. So that's what they were doing here as mentioned in a different lecture is they actually uh, looked at different parks and used these species area curves to know when they're done. So they were measuring for a large park and a small park. And what you see is the large park had more than the small park. Well, that just makes sense. Take a moment to consider what other factors may be increasing biodiversity at these parks. And if you said, well, the biodiversity of the plants, then that's probably absolutely right. If you also thought the distance away from the outside of the city, that's also right. So there is within a city a space between parks. So if you were to think about this, um, the bigger the area, the more the species, well, yes, but there is a maximum. You saw they took, they, they're taking the logs here. There is a maximum. It does kind of even out after a while. And also it depends on whether or not the species can actually migrate between parks. So a large park that is close to the outside of the city is going to get colonization events from outside the city 
pretty often. A series of small parks throughout the city is going to effectively act like an urban archipelago. If you think of an archipelago as a group of islands, the urban archipelago is the group of all parks or all available habitats within a greater city. And would you predict all species will eventually colonize all parks? You probably start thinking, well, it depends if their food is there. You can also think about how this relates to genetic diversity. The um, more intense the matrix, so the matrix being the roads and concrete and herbicided lawns between with pesticides and fumigating buildings, the more intense the matrix, the less there's going to be migration between, and therefore the lower genetic diversity. But urban planning comes into place. So urban planning <clears throat> can lead to a series of parks that is actually going to be contiguous or at least um, having larger parks preventing species loss. And this can actually maintain certain species within a city. And you're thinking, well, that's great, but there's only really need for one species in the city, and that's man. Well, yes, but you're going to have pigeons. So why not have a larger park that would help have falcons? take care of those pigeons. They're just flying rats. Um, rats, ah, why not have a large enough park to have a coyote? That'll take care of the rat problem. And you're like, hold on, hold on, no coyotes in parks, fine. Foxes. We don't have foxes in park. Mm. You need to look this up on what's going on in England. They have plenty of foxes going around. So think about the parks as urban services. The bigger the parks and the less matrix they have to move through, to get from one place to another, the more you can actually get the benefits from the species that live in the parks, even if they're just, say, songbirds. So <clears throat> I want you to think as well what factors influence the movement between subpopulations. This is kind of one of those back and forth moments that I'm hoping we can do without not wearing kind of masks. So how would movement rate depend on dispersal? What kind of problems could be created by the intervening matrix? And would predation rates in a subpopulation increase or decrease movement to another subpopulation? <coughs> Are organisms going to move if predation is present? Are they more likely or less likely to leave? Think about it on your own. Look up some more. Look up some stuff. I actually have a paper on this with Ashley Maciejewski, um, published back in 2014, I think. So she really did a good job of looking at different parks in the city of Buffalo. All right. Here's a different type of metapopulation. <coughs> Organisms living on mountaintops. Mountaintops are just islands in the sky. And sometimes they get isolated. So back in the 1920s, 12 mountain goats were introduced to the Olympic Park for, uh, for us to hunt. The population expanded to about 700. And think about this population of mountain goats, not as just living on Mount Elidore, but on as a series of smaller populations living on different mountains. And this is part of the same population in the Cascade Range if the entire Puget Sound didn't exist. Ah, so you see, we have a metapopulation, but you can't have movement between them. Well, we want the Olympics to, Olympic population to actually go extinct because they're not native there. So people are taking the goats and bringing them back to the Cascade Range. And you think, I didn't see anyone walking a goat. No, they're just flying by helicopter. Again, just like the fish cannon, you got to look this stuff up. You can't make this stuff up. So it should be this fall, actually, in fall 2020, we're going to legalize hunting the goats again, and that should get rid of these excess number of goats. So I hope to get some goat stew out of that. But either way, the population of goats in the Cascade Range is a metapopulation there existing on the mountain ranges with some migration between them. If you're asking, okay, so migration, what do you mean? Do they just go down to the valleys? No. Think back to dispersal. There's a dispersal stage for goats. And this dispersal stages are keep metapopulations connected 